Hi, this is Governor Pete Ricketts, and welcome to another edition of The Nebraska Way, a podcast about how Nebraska is growing and so much more. We're excited to have another edition here today where we're going to be talking about how parents and kids can have a choice in education. And so we've got a great guest who's going to be able to talk to us about that, Corey DeAngelis. And Corey, you've got a lot of uh, things going on here with regard to your background. So let me just hit a couple of them. You're the National Director uh, for Research for the American Federation of Children. You are the Executive Director of the Education Freedom Institute. You're also an adjunct scholar at the Cato Institute, a senior fellow at the Reason Foundation. You have uh, made the Forbes 30 under 30 list for your work in education. So uh, you've been published in about 40 articles, book chapters, uh, you know, that sort of thing. And in fact, uh, I think you're also the co-editor of a book, uh, School Choice Myths, Setting the Record Straight. You've also been published uh, numerous times in peer-reviewed journals like the Peabody Journal of Education and the Education Review. So you've got a lot of great work there. You've got a PhD from the University of Arkansas and a BBA and an MA from University of Texas in Austin. So a lot of background with regard to education. That's what you write about. That's what you do. You actually also recently appeared at one of my uh, conferences talking about school choice. So uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us here today to be able to talk about this important topic. We're going to get into more about uh, Nebraska and and where we stand on this. But but before we do, why don't you just give us a little background. How did you get involved in education and doing all this research on education and how school choice impacts not just educational choices, but all sorts of other things with regard to kids and how they develop. Yeah, so I actually attended government-run schools all through my K-12 education in Texas. But for high school, I was actually able to attend something called a magnet school, a school that you're not residentially assigned to. And for for four years, on a day-to-day basis, I saw the glaring differences between the school that I was residentially assigned to was actually on the same campus and the magnet school that I had the opportunity to attend. And there was just night and day differences in the quality of education and the culture of the two schools. And so I've pushed to fight for other families to have expanded educational opportunities as well. But it shouldn't really just be limited to government-run schools, whether that's a magnet school or a traditional school. That should also be uh, options such as charter schools or private schools or home-based options. The money should follow the child to wherever they're getting an education. And I also did my bachelor's and master's in economics at the University of Texas at San Antonio. And thinking about the education system from an economic lens really opened my mind to the main problem with K-12 education in America, which happens to be these huge geographic monopolies that are created through residential assignment and then also compulsory funding through property taxes. Just imagine if you're residentially assigned to your nearest neighborhood government-run grocery store, and you couldn't switch to another provider unless you moved houses. That would give that provider very little incentive to cater to your needs. And I see that there's the same kind of problems when it comes to K-12 education all across the country. So how did you get into that magnet school in the first place? Like, uh, did your parents make that choice? Did you make that choice? And what was the criteria for you to get into that magnet school that other kids didn't get that opportunity? Yes, yeah, so there was actually four different magnet schools with different specializations in the district that uh, where I grew up in San Antonio. The one that I went to is actually a communications-focused magnet school, and you had to apply to get in. Uh, and I think there were there were a couple of admissions criteria when it came to the grades and then your attendance at the middle school that you attended. And it was partially my decision based on my interests, but it was also based on uh, what my parents saw was the best option for me at the time. And yeah, I think other families should have these types of opportunities, uh, but then not just magnet school opportunities, but private school opportunities, uh, charter school opportunities, and home-based learning as well. Again, the money should follow the child to wherever they're getting an education. After all, education funding is supposed to be meant for educating children, not for propping up and protecting protecting a particular institution. Well, Corey, you're getting ahead of us because we're going to get there. So we talk about uh, following the uh, money, following the child. But uh, let's talk a little bit about, because you've used that word uh, school choice and so forth. And talk to me about, so Nebraska is one of the states that is actually behind when it comes to school choice. You know, we don't have a charter school law. We don't have a voucher program, nothing like that. 
that would be more indicative of dollars following the child. What really defines having school choice? And because some people might say, well, you got a chance to go to that magnet school. Isn't that school choice? So talk to me a little about what does it, what it actually define? Uh, what does it mean to have school choice in your state? Yeah, I've actually changed the conversation, I believe, nationally and changed the conversation from using the word school choice because it's uh, so confusing to a lot of people and uh, people get lost in the weeds in the discussion about school choice. I've changed it from saying school choice to talking about it in terms of funding students directly or funding students as opposed to systems. And it's beneficial to talk about because it's more transparent, right? It's right. the money following the child to wherever they're getting an education. That still could be your government-run school or public school. But if not, for whatever reason, the money could follow the child to a private school, a charter school, or homeschooling option as well. And there's a lot of different ways to do this. One is a tax credit scholarship program. There are voucher programs, education savings account programs. But they're all the same traditional idea of the money following the child to wherever they're getting an education. An easier way to think about it is to think about how we already do this with so many other taxpayer funded initiatives. Just think about it with higher education. We have money following the student when it comes to Pell Grants and the GI Bill. The money goes to the student and then they can choose public or private, religious or non-religious universities that work best for them. Same thing with pre-K programs, whether that's state-funded or federally-funded programs, such as the Head Start program. The money doesn't go to a residentially assigned, government-run provider of pre-K services, regardless of the choice of the family. Instead, the money rightfully goes to the families, and they can choose public, private, religious, or non-religious providers of pre-K services. So school choice or funding students, not systems, is applying that same logic to K-12 education. Well, I got to tell you, now... I'm a school choice proponent, so I'm a little biased on this anyway, but well, who could disagree with that? I mean, it sounds like why wouldn't you want the dollars to follow the child? Because I think one thing that all parents know is you're all, your kids are all different. They all learn different ways. Some people are visual learners. Some people are, they learn better if they hear something. And so, you know, kids are gonna learn different ways. And so trying to find the right educational uh, venue for them would make the most sense as far as their best opportunity to learn. So you would want the dollars to follow the kid. Yet we have, you know, here in Nebraska, as we've tried to introduce school choice options, we've had the uh, Nebraska State Education Association, which is our teachers union, oppose it. And other groups like Stand Up for Schools oppose it. Uh, why do we have organizations like this that are opposing something that seems like so basic of like just have the dollars follow the child? I mean, look, it shouldn't be a partisan issue, but uh, the reality is that this is more about power than it is about logic or morality. The problem here, I mean, it's really illustrated by the, the fact that, look, a lot of the same people that support funding students directly with higher education and pre-K and support funding individuals as opposed to institutions when it comes to every other industry, including, just think about food stamps, for example. The money doesn't go to a residentially assigned government-run grocery store regardless of the choice of the family. Instead, the money follows the family's decision. You can take it to Safeway if you want, but you can also take it to Russ's or, or Walmart or Trader Joe's. The money follows the decision of the family. And so what's interesting to me is, is always pointing out that a lot of the same people that support all of these other initiatives that funds students or individuals as opposed to institutions or systems, they get all up in arms only when it comes to the in-between years of K-12 education. And the only difference is one of power dynamics, that choice is the norm when it comes to higher education and pre-K, and yeah. choice is the norm in just about any other industry in the United States, but choice threatens an entrenched special interest that would otherwise profit from receiving children's education dollars, regardless of the satisfaction of the families and regardless of what they would prefer for their children and the best options for them. So they fight really hard against any change to the status quo because they want to receive children's education dollars regardless of how well they do, and they want to maintain their monopoly uh, on the current system. And so, look, it's not about logic. It's about power. So that's, so that's why the teachers union are against this is because they're worried that they're going to lose power if all of a sudden now kids and parents have really the ability to pick where they're going to go based upon the dollars following them. They can choose the, the kind of education venue they want, and they may not choose the one where the teachers union is. Is that essentially it? 
Yeah, that's basically it. And it's it, again, it's highlighted by the reality that a lot of these same people that are calling to force students into one particular uh, provider of education services support funding students directly with higher education and pre-K. There's no other good reason as to why you would support funding people for everything else, but not when it comes to K-12 education, besides the reason that it threatens their monopoly. They want to keep the, 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 the power that they hold with the status quo system. And so they perpetuate myths over and over again to prevent any change to the status quo. For the, the biggest one you'll hear is that school choice sounds great and all, but it steals money from the public schools right. or it siphons away funding from the public schools, but they have it completely backwards. The money doesn't belong to the public schools in the first place. Again, education funding is meant for educating children, not for propping up and protecting any particular institution. Pell Grants don't steal money from community colleges just because they can be used at private religious schools. <laughs> Pre-K pro program funding doesn't steal money from public providers of pre-K just because they can be used at private providers of pre-K. Food stamps don't steal money from Safeway just because they, they can be used to shop at Walmart. The money belongs to the family, not the institution. And that's where the other side gets things completely backwards. They, they, they truly believe that your children and the money that is associated with educating your children belong to their schools, but that's not true. Um, and look, Hold, hold on a second. It, if your main argument is that allowing families to choose something else will destroy your institution, what does that tell you about your belief in the services that you're providing to families? The best schools will welcome the competition and say, you know what, I think I can do a good job and earn your business. And at the same time, competition is a rising tide that lifts all boats. 26 of 28 studies on the topic actually find that private school competition through school choice initiatives leads to better outcomes in the public schools too. So this is truly a win-win situation until again, you start to think about the politics and power dynamics of the teachers. So is this part of what some of the research you've done has looked at is like when you have these choice options, it actually drives better outcomes just in general, no matter the venue you're picking for your education. Is that, is that fair? Yeah, that's true. Um, competition is a rising tide that lifts all boats in any industry, including education as well. And so when families have true exit options, the public schools up their game a little bit and they start to scratch their heads and think about how they allocate resources. And they start to put more of those resources towards things like teacher salaries and other expenses in the classroom instead of towards administrative bloat. And so the students are actually better off and the teachers are better off as well. There have been five studies on the subject that look at the relationship between either charter school or private school competition and the teacher salaries in the public school system, all of these studies actually find that that competition leads to higher teacher salaries in the public schools too. And so while the other side will try to say that this is, if you're pro school choice, you must be anti-teacher, the evidence shows the opposite of that because when you have a monopoly employer, they don't have great incentives to cater to the needs of their employees either. So again, school choice is a win-win-win situation for every party involved, except for those at the top ranks of the teachers' unions. That's really interesting. So you've got studies that show that, again, I guess it makes sense. If you're, It's not only the outcomes for the students that's better, but it's also the outcomes for the teachers because they're going to see, at least in many of these studies, that their pay actually goes up as schools compete for those good teachers, they want to, you know, obviously they want to attract the best teachers. So they're going to have to pay them more because there's competition out there. Right. I mean, that's kind of the, the yeah, way it works totally in every other right. industry. I mean, if, yeah, if you look at what, if you look at a study by Ben Scafferty at Kennesaw State University, he's the economics professor out there. He looked at data nationwide and he looked in Nebraska as well, but nationwide, the trend from 1992 to 2014, he saw an increase in per pupil education expenditures by about 27%. But real teacher salaries that they're adjusting for inflation actually dropped by 2% over that period. And it's because they just put more people, more dues paying members into the system and started spending more on administrative bloat instead of on the, uh, the teachers in the system. And so when you get that competition, the employers, that monopoly starts to have stronger incentives to actually spend that money wisely in the classroom because otherwise families will vote with their feet and go somewhere else. And in Nebraska is, is no exception to this rule. Nebraska spends over $14,200 per student per year, according to the latest numbers from the U.S. Census Bureau in 2019. It's probably much higher now. 
private schools in Nebraska spend about a third of that, yeah. or, or they cost at least to attend private school about a third of that, about $4,022 per student per year, according to private school review in the 2021 school year. Just imagine if some of that money that we spend in the public schools followed the child, families would be able to access so many other types of private options, and the public schools could actually financially benefit as well. Uh, you could you could say give give the families half of that fourteen thousand. Let the public schools keep some of it. Let the taxpayer keep some of it. And then again, you truly create this win win situation where the public schools keep thousands of dollars for students they're no they longer educating have, right. and actually financially benefit on a per pupil basis. Imagine if you left Safeway and started shopping at Russ's, and Safeway got to keep fifty percent of your grocery bill each week for groceries they weren't providing. To, to your family. They'd be happy with that deal and the public schools actually financially benefit and they should be happy with the deal that comes along with school choice programs such as opportunity scholarship programs and education savings accounts. So actually, isn't that how some of these programs have gotten passed in other states, not Nebraska, obviously, where you have, uh, say, a charter school will get $7,000 a student yeah. and the Local public schools are are getting fourteen thousand. I'm making that number up, but so they're getting about half or whatever. It's certainly a, a fraction of what the public schools are getting, and so the legislation got passed where the charter schools have to go out and figure out how to make it work with just half the money per student. Yep, that's uh, one of the ways to make these types of bills politically feasible. And every voucher program or private school choice initiative that I've seen, the funding amount is tied as a percentage of what would have been spent in the traditional schools in order to guarantee taxpayer savings. And at the same time, uh, it guarantees benefits for the public schools too. Again, on a per pupil basis, their revenues per pupil go up because they keep funding for students that are no longer there. That's a great deal for them. It should be a win-win-win situation. Yeah. And actually, you know, you mentioned earlier about uh, private schools. I've, I've been associated with some of the inner city Catholic schools and the cost of tuition doesn't cover the, the cost of education, but then they go out and find other ways to be able to make up that difference through charitable contributions and so forth. But even with that, if you look at what we're spending per student uh, in the public schools versus what uh, private schools or uh, these ones that I was associated with at least, their cost of educating a child was generally a half or two thirds of what the public schools were spending on a per student basis. So you see they don't have the same administrative overhead costs, which is when I look at a lot of school uh, district budgets, I see a lot of money going in and I don't necessarily see a lot of more money being spent per student. So I gotta start asking what, what, what's going on here? Where's the, that, those dollars going? And you know it's it's tough because school funding is so complicated that it's difficult for your average parent to be able to get in there and kind of unpack all that to be able to see how those dollars are being spent. Is that something that you've yeah, seen? Well, yeah, I think that's right. Um, especially even when you have um, reporting of of the, the spending patterns in the public school system, there are a lot of times there's these broad categories. So even if you go and do the research, it's hard to tell what exact what does the instruction mean? What, what did you actually spend it on? What is capital expenditures? What does that actually mean to the average consumer of this information? It does it, it oftentimes doesn't make a lot of sense. But what does make sense to families is they can look at one school and they can look at another school and understand which one they prefer for their for their child. And they can see, look, the public school spending over fourteen thousand dollars per child per year. If I get about half of that, I could afford this, that or the other private education option that I see to be a better fit for my child. So while things may be complicated when you get into the weeds with the budgets, parents know best for their own child and they're in the best position to make that decision for their kids. Yeah, absolutely. So we've talked a little about the teachers union and you talked about the power and, and them holding on to it and uh, really stifling a lot of the, the choices for parents and kids. What can teachers do? I mean, we've seen the teachers union nationally and here in the state of Nebraska, both have supported critical race theory, which is a corrosive theory that is anti-American. Um, and then they've also been part of slowing down school reopenings. What can teachers do? What, who can they be associated with if the union's not reflecting their values? 
And there's actually a website called teacherfreedom.org. So if you're a teacher and you're not aligned with the values of the teachers' unions, you can find alternative providers of these services at teacherfreedom.org. One of the big ones is the Association of American Educators. Uh, so that the, there are options for teachers as well. But I will say if we had a, a, an education marketplace where families could vote with their feet, to the providers that work best for them, you'd probably see more of these alternative providers of educator associations popping up in the private sector as well. But there are, there are a, a few of them out there uh, all across the country. And again, that's teacherfreedom.org if you want to check out some of those alternatives. And so what are some of the things they provide? So for example, one of the things I've heard is that teachers are part of the teachers union because they give the liability protection in case they get sued. Is that kind of some of what these other organizations do? Yeah, that's, that's the big thing here is the, that liability insurance for the teachers. Um, because look, to be real, it, 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 it is a tough decision for a teacher if they don't know that they have an alternative provider of this service, service to, it's a tough decision. They may not like what's going on in the classroom. They may not like the political activity of the teachers unions, but then a lot of them will remain in the, in the public sector teachers union to, uh, to have all these other services. So if you, if you go to teacherfreedom.org, you can find alternatives. And I think a lot of it's just informing educators that they do have uh, alternative uh, providers of these options. And I, I think if you can, can inform them of, of, of these, these options that they have, we'd see uh, different, different membership numbers in the public sector union. So you spoke at my economic development conference uh, and then you said it here several times about the dollars following the student. What's so important about that? You talked about, again, some of the, you know, just kind of the simple economic examples from a grocery store, but what are some of the, the real world uh, examples from your research you've seen when those dollars file, follow the children and what it means for those children and for those families? Yeah, I think the best evidence is asking families what they'd prefer. I mean, there's the latest uh, polling on this came out, I want to say a couple of days ago from Braun Research and EdChoice publicized these findings, but they found that 83% of kids are in government run or district run schools in the United States. And I believe the numbers are pretty similar in Nebraska, but the percentage of families that said that they would actually choose that when given a real option with money following the child was less than half of that proportion. It was only about 39% of families said they would prefer that for their child. So that mismatch tells you right away that families are not satisfied with where their, current, their, their, their children are currently at. And if you look at the evidence on satisfaction levels among these programs, they're overwhelmingly positive. I believe there's about 20 to 30 studies that look at the effects of getting to attend a private school through a school choice program mechanism on satisfaction, and just about all of them are positive, including all of the random assignment evaluations of this outcome. For example, I live in DC, and we have an opportunity scholarship program where the public schools spend <laughs> over $30,000 per kid. The voucher is is at an amount of about $10,000 per kid, so about a third of the cost. And the random assignment evaluation conducted by the, by the uh, federal government found no effects on standardized test scores at a third of the cost, so that's a, a cost savings at, at least. But they also found huge increases in reports of safety and satisfaction. <laughs> So if you look at why families are choosing particular schools, sometimes it's about the academics, but other times it's about values and safety for their children and the culture of the school that they're at. So the evidence on safety and satisfaction is overwhelmingly positive. And there's also a strand of evidence. There's six studies that link school choice to criminal to crime in later life outcomes. And all six of these studies are peer reviewed and find that school choice opportunities through charter schools or private school choice programs leads to reductions in crime as well. Well, wow. what about, uh, you mentioned in that one DC study that the academic outcomes were about the same and you mentioned, well, at least we get cost savings out of it. Do we see that by having uh, the dollars follow the child that we get better academic uh, outcomes in other school districts or is it just what you talked about? It's about the same, but we get uh, the cost savings. 
As to the other school districts, um, again, the evidence is pretty clear on this subject that competition is a rising tide that lifts all boats. 26 to 28 studies find statistically significant positive effects from school choice competition on the kids who remain in the public school system. So you don't even have to use the program to benefit from it because of those system-wide benefits. And in the DC evaluation, actually, there was a 2013 study, random assignment, gold standard evaluation, no clear benefits on test scores, but on academics in the longer term, high school graduation rates increased by 21 percentage points or 30%. So there are huge improvements on these longer term academic benefits that didn't show up in the short run. Well, and just like you were talking about, if it's helping keeping uh, those students from criminal activity that ends up uh, you know, getting them incarcerated, then that's also a longer term kind of benefit to it as well. That's not going to show up on a test yeah. score necessarily. Absolutely. And if you ask families why they choose one school over the other, they, they rank safety and uh, the values of uh, character education of the school much higher than something that's on a standardized test. And look, with all of the debates that we're seeing right now about critical race theory or other curricular issues, these are really just symptoms of the one size fits all problem that is the current government runs education system. Uh, where there's the only way forward out of this in a world where we're going to disagree about what should be taught to our children, the only way forward without forcing a one size fits all system on other people's kids is to allow each family to take their children's education dollars to the education provider that works best for them. That's the way forward to, to, in which we embrace freedom over force. Yeah, just like we do in just about every other segment of our society. Just imagine if we were all residentially assigned to a government-run grocery store, we all had to fight with one another about the one-size-fits-all uniform set of groceries that we all had. We'd have the meat, the meat, uh, the, the the meat eaters lobby coming out trying to get what they would want in the bag. We'd have the vegan lobby doing their own thing, and everybody would be stuck with a bag of groceries that they weren't totally happy with, and it would be extremely costly. That's what we're seeing in the public school system today, and it doesn't make sense to, to structure things that way. So what have states been doing over the course of the last couple of years with regard to these to create policies that help support uh, you know, kids and families being able to choose the education venue they want and to have those dollars follow the child? Yeah, so nationwide, we're calling 2021 the year of school choice, or if you're really hip with the lingo by now, 2021 is the year we fund students, not systems, because 18 states this year enacted or expanded programs to fund students as opposed to systems. Nebraska came pretty close with uh, LB364, the Opportunity Scholarship Act, which uh, I think fell three or four votes short of the two-thirds majority required to break the filibuster. Uh, but look, it's getting closer and closer in states like Nebraska too. Um, people are finally figuring out that there isn't any good reason to fund institutions when you can fund the student directly instead. And so we're moving that, that in that direction all across the country. You look at nationwide polling on this from Real Clear Opinion Research, for example, they found a 10 percentage point jump in support for school choice from April of 2020. So in April 2020, there was 64% support among the general population to June of 2021, 74% support among the general population. There was also a Braun research poll that just came out a couple of days ago, finding 78% of Americans support funding students as opposed to systems. So there's uh, it's just a groundswell of support among all of these issues over the past year. People are figuring out that the problems with the K-12 education system have a lot to do with the fact that we fund the buildings and not the kids. It's a time for us to get our priorities right and fund students, not systems. So I think I'm, I'm optimistic about this happening in the near future, hopefully in Nebraska as well. So speaking of happy at Nebraska as well, what have you seen has helped other states actually get legislation like this passed? What have other states done that maybe Nebraska is not doing? Yeah, so uh, I mean, education is key, right? Just combating the myths that are perpetuated by the status quo, the teachers union monopoly, you have to uh, beat them on their arguments. And once you beat them on their arguments, it has to do with uh, power dynamics as well. I mean, elections matter. And um, if the teachers union has a control over a particular candidate, uh, even if you can beat 
beat them on the logic and the, and the morality of the matter, a lot of the times that isn't enough to get past those power dynamics. So uh, it, it depends on who's in office, but it also depends on getting the arguments right. So you're saying one of the things you got to do is just go out and def- put new sp- legislators in place to, <laughs> to be able to get this passed. Well, that's part of it, but at the same time, um, it's one thing for a a, um, a school choice advocate to come and make the arguments in favor of school choice, but you also have to mobilize families in order to put the pressure on on, on the side of educational freedom as well. So I think a, a good uh, recommendation that I've seen in other states is families just going and telling their story. I mean, I can share data with you day in and day out about the benefits of these programs, but stories matter too. And families are really convincing, especially when they've benefited from these programs themselves. You can't really argue with that. You can't really argue that with a a person's livid experience that a scholarship wouldn't have helped them or, or that they should have been better off in the school where they were getting bullied or where they were in a, in a location where they weren't actually right. learning. Um, I think stories are really important part yeah. of the sto- a part of the picture as well. So now one of the things we've been trying to get done is a tax credit scholarship program. Other states have, you know, voucher programs or um, charter school programs. We don't have either one of those. Uh, I mean, obviously we fell short of even getting our tax credit scholarship program funded or even put into law. So what, is there a step that you've seen in other states have been successful? Do they start with tax credits and then uh, work their way up to say charter schools or something like that? Or does it really matter? Is it different in every state? Kind of what have you seen in different states with regard to be able to get some of these programs done? I don't think it matters at this point. I mean, uh, different states have done different things. I mean, a lot of states have done charter schools first. There are more states with charter schools than there are private school choice programs. But look, the majority of, of states do have some type of private school choice program, either that, that if that's a voucher or a tax credit scholarship or an education savings account program. But I think what matters is getting the policy that works best for your state. I think all of these things are, are great steps in the right direction for all states, but more and more legislators are moving towards this idea of education savings accounts, which I would call the purest form of funding students directly that we have available. All the other uh, types are good as well, but this has really become the gold standard of educational freedom, where it's kind of like the idea where the funding follows the child to a private school to pay for tuition and fees. But this takes another step forward in that it allows you to take your child's state-funded education dollars to go into their own personal education savings account to be spent on any approved education expenditure. That could be private school tuition and fees, but it could also be homeschooling options such as micro schools or pandemic pods. It could be tutoring, special needs services, any approved education expenditure. So it really allows for maximum flexibility on the part of the families and again, this is the gold standard of school choice going forward. So many states, I want to say over 30 states, introduced some type of uh, private school choice legislation this year. And I want to say most of them were in the form of education savings accounts. This is where most um, lawmakers are, are transitioning to as the new gold standard. But that said, tax credit scholarships and voucher programs are similar proposals that would also be great opportunities for, for families uh, in any state. Now, you talked about this a little bit earlier about the argument the teachers union make, like, oh, you're hurting public schools when you do this. What research do you have out there uh, about some of these things like the, these education savings accounts and how they actually don't take dollars away from the, we talked about, you know, teacher salaries going up, that's great, but uh, the teacher union is always asking, uh, you know, arguing about uh, the, the schools themselves. What kind of research out there have you done or know about that actually talks about when you introduce an education savings account, how uh, you know the public schools continue to get funded. Yeah, so EdChoice has a great resource on a ton of different aspects of school choice literature. So for one, one of their reports is called the one, two, threes of school choice, where they summarize about 50 or 60 different evaluations of the taxpayer effects of these types of programs in other states. And just about all of them find that this leads to taxpayer savings for the, the state taxpayer as a whole, but then also for individual school districts. And I mean, this, this shouldn't be all that surprising. It shouldn't 
take 50 or 60 studies to convince anybody of this because it's just basic math, right? If you if you if your school gets fourteen thousand dollars per kid and you lose seven thousand, well, that means you get to keep a, a several thousand dollars for a child that's no longer there. Mathematically, you end up with more money per child. And for the state taxpayer at the same time, if you create the bill in the right way as a percentage of what the state taxpayer would have spent in the public schools, then you're going to be end up you're going to end up saving the taxpayer at the state level money as well. Uh, so I think that's the the best evidence to combat this claim. But I, I, I think really as well, just pointing out that the money doesn't belong to any particular institution is a powerful response to the teachers unions. Yeah. Food stamps don't steal money from Walmart. Pell Grants don't steal money from community colleges because look, the money belongs to the family and their students. Same goes for K through 12 education. Education funding is meant for educating the child, not for protecting and propping up a particular institution, public or private. It doesn't belong to the public schools. It doesn't belong to the private schools. It belongs to the family. And if the public school is the best option for them, that should absolutely still be on the table. So what can Nebraska do to build on this momentum that you're talking about nationwide with regard to people wanting to have more opportunities, more choice? And what organizations are working in Nebraska to be able to help bring about that idea of having the dollars follow the child? Yeah, so the American Federation for Children, uh, where I'm employed, we have a state director out there. The Nebraska Federation for Children is a great resource uh, pushing for educational freedom in the state. Uh, and, and you also have uh, other groups as well. I mean, the Catholic Con Conference has been a, a supporter of educational freedom as well. And then look, families are mobilized around this issue. Families know that allowing them to have more options is, is, is great for them. Uh, it's, it's great for their families. And uh, there are a few other uh, groups out there as, as well pushing for this. So do you think the pandemic has had an impact on this as well from the standpoint of, you know, obviously one of the things that uh, is talked about here and other places is mask mandates in schools and that sort of thing. Uh, not just, you know, with in society in general, but specifically in schools and, uh, you know, how that impacts kids and how parents feel about them. Do you think that's another example of why we need to have the dollars follow the child? Yeah, I mean, all of these things, whether it's mask mandates or critical race theory or gen or uh, you know sex comprehensive sex education, education in, yeah. comprehensive sex education in the classroom, all of these things are just symptoms of the larger problem, which is the one size fits all government school system, and that doesn't mean that public schools are, are, are worse or better than private schools. It just means that one size fits all systems. Period don't work when we're going to disagree on what should be included in the curriculum and what types of mitigation strategies should be used in a school. So you have other states, for example, Florida's Board of Education unanimously approved allowing families to take their children's education dollars to a private school if they disagree with their public school's masking policy. That's just an, another one of the disagreements that there are so many different reasons why families might not be happy with their public school uh, whether that's curriculum, masking, academic outcomes, safety. And this is a step in, dire in the direction, in the right direction when it comes to Florida's new program, allowing for more families to have those options. Arizona just announced a new program as well, where if, if, a, if, a, if a school is imposing unnecessary COVID restrictions on the child, whether that comes to mandated masks or... Um, or if they close for in-person instruction full-time, full five days a week, families are now eligible to apply for federal relief dollars to be able to take that funding to a private school as well in Arizona. So we're seeing some of that pop up. There's more and more discussions about that happening in different states as well. Some people are even talking about introducing legislation to allow families to take their money elsewhere if they disagree with the masking policy. I believe Arkansas legislators introduced a bill on that topic. Yeah, so that's, a, that's really interesting. Again, you know, because uh, you, you mentioned uh, talking about different policies, uh, whether it's critical race theory or uh, the CECAS, which is driving, driving these really radical comprehensive sex education standards, which are really political 
I mean, they're, they're very upfront about it. They're talking about it. it's poly, it's uh, sex education for change is their whole thing, and it's about driving an, like gender ideology and that sort of thing. So it's not it's not biological reproductive science. Uh, so, but that's but that can happen in private schools as well, and I've, I've read about instances where it happens in private schools. But then, in that case, the parent actually has a choice to move, whereas if you've got um, uh, a monopoly, you don't have that choice. Yeah, and I'm and I'm willing to agree to disagree, but we should not be forcing other forcing other people's kids into an institution that does not align with their family's values. I don't believe that we should. Uh, try to force other people's kids into a curriculum that doesn't align with their parents' values. At the same time, I shouldn't be forced to send my kids to a school that where I feel like they're being brainwashed each day politically uh, with these types of comprehensive uh, sex education standards or other types of critical race theory uh, standards that might make their way into the classroom. So the, the best way forward, as I said earlier, to move forward with freedom over force is to allow families to take their children's education dollars to the institution that aligns with their values. That way we don't have to fight about the one size fits all set of curriculum that's imposed on other people's kids in the public school system. So has any of your research focused on who is impacted most by these monopolistic you know, powers that the yeah. teachers union has here? Yeah. I mean, who, who gets hurt the worst by this? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is, the, 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 the brunt of the influence from the teachers unions and those negative effects that result are felt by the least advantaged in society. I mean, just think about it. The least advantaged tend to be stuck in the worst government run schools and the most advantaged are the most likely to be able to afford to live in a neighborhood that is nearby to a, a the higher quality public schools are more likely to be able to afford to pay for private school tuition and fees out of pocket. They're more likely to be able to afford an adequate home-based education. And so funding students directly would empower more families to have those same kinds of options. And in that way, school choice is an equalizer. And so this really shouldn't be a partisan issue at all, especially if we're all for uh, promoting equity in the education system. Um, School choice is already available to the to the most advantaged. We should allow less advantaged families to have the same kinds of opportunities. And look, the public schools in Nebraska spend over fourteen thousand dollars per kid per year. Why not give that money to the families and allow less advantaged populations to access so many other types of private education options that are already available to the most advantaged in society? Yeah, I've heard others say that. Uh School choice is the uh, civil rights issue of our time just for that reason about who is being impacted by this. Uh, you know, the most disadvantaged are the ones who have the least ability to actually get that choice through other means. Yeah, that's absolutely right. And what's really frustrating to me is a lot of the same people who vote against school choice for others exercise school choice for their own kids, or they benefited from school choice from being able to attend private schools when they were younger. I believe a um, Justin Wayne was on the floor in Nebraska calling out his colleagues for essentially being hypocrites on the issue of school choice. And I'm uh, glad that he called that out, but it, it is uh, so prevalent in this arena that you have politicians who have school choice for their own kids, but then deny it for less advantaged populations. At the Educational Freedom Institute, where I'm executive director, we actually have something called the school choice hypocrisy map um, at our website. If you want to go look it up, you can just Google school choice hypocrisy map and you'll find it. And I believe there are a couple of names included from the state of Nebraska as well. Very good. So what are the current topics that you're working on right now or anything else that we did not cover uh, in the course of our conversation here? Yeah, some of my latest research looked at the relationship between teachers union influence and the likelihood that schools were reopening in the fall of 2020. And surprise, surprise, uh, that research found that while there was no statistically significant consistent relationship between COVID risk and the reopening decisions of schools, there were very strong relationships between the politicization of, of the topic in the area, and then also the strength of the teachers unions in the area. The stronger teachers unions, the bluer areas were less likely to reopen for in-person instruction, all else equal. And I can I plan to continue that work going forward to look at other types of 
effects of these lockdowns on academic results for kids, but then also mental health results for kids as well. The CDC recently released data from uh, the past year. There's been uh, an uptick in emergency department visits related to teen suicide attempts over the past mm -hmm. year, um, which is absolutely horrendous. And I believe it, it deserves some more uh, looking into that relationship between the teachers union influence and negative health care health outcomes for kids. Another recent study out of California, I believe, found that teen uh, obesity rates for five to 11 year olds increased by about 10 percentage points over the past year. So there's a lot of unintended consequences that can come along with government overreach when it comes to education freedom and whether it comes to other types of freedom to live our everyday lives. And I think we need to pay more attention to those unintended consequences that come along with any policy to that restricts individual freedom. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So how can people stay up to date with what you're doing or follow along on your research or just in general to find out about what you're doing? Hey, you can follow me on Twitter. It's uh, at DeAngelis Corey, just my last name and then my first name. But if you want to help join the fight towards empowering more families by funding students, not systems, you can go to fundstudentsnotsystems.org. All right, great. Anything else you want to cover here before we wrap up? This all sounds great. I'm, I'm really thankful that uh, you had me on, on your podcast, Governor Ricketts, and uh, I'm looking forward to hopefully seeing you again soon. All right. Well, Corey, thank you so much for coming to Nebraska to do our conference. And thank you so much for spending the time today here on the podcast and telling us about some of these really important concepts about the dollars following the, the children and how to think about that relative to just the everyday things in society that we take for granted. Uh, that's It's actually something that... Uh, I've not thought about the way you were presenting it here today. It's, it's really interesting. Your examples with the grocery store, for example, <laughs> makes total sense. So thanks very much for uh, sharing that with us as well. And then, of course, for uh, our listeners and viewers, uh, please continue to uh, you know, download our podcast here. If you have an opportunity, it'd be great if you could go on and give us a five-star review. We certainly appreciate that. And then, of course, you can... Uh, uh, like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, at GovRicketts. We're on Instagram. We're going to continue to find great guests like we've got here with Corey to be able to talk about important issues that are impacting the state of Nebraska. And uh, we look forward to having you on our next edition of the Nebraska Way. So thank you again for taking the time. And Corey, thank you again for taking the time. And again, I hope that we can catch up again in the future soon. Thank you. Paid for by Pete Ricketts for Governor, 1610 N Street, Suite 100, Lincoln, Nebraska, 68508.